Carlos, Carlos, pues mirar si hay algo fuera. Para avisarlos. Ah, pues. Vale. La cosa va en serio, ¿eh? La cosa, la cosa va en serio. Muy bien, muy bien. Espero un segundo que, a que... A ver si viene Carlos por ahí. Okay, so it's time to, to continue with this last session of the school. Uh, we will start with Pablo Martín Luna, who um, studied here in Valencia and is uh, developing his PhD also here in this university. And he will be uh, talking about particle accelerators, so continuing with the topic. Please, Pablo. <laughs> vale, ahora se me oye bien. Okay, so I will start. Uh, well, the title of the of the charge of the talk is Novel High Gradient Particle Accelerator. Um, I will start with an introduction uh, that is something similar that Pablo has talked about in the previous talk. Then I will explain the two uh, techniques that I want to to talk about that I want to explain to you and finally I will finish with a summary. Well, uh, base, conventional accelerators are basically based on radio frequency technology and this technology we have these uh, cavities where for example if we have an electron here then this electron is accelerated in this first cavity and these uh, electromagnetic fields are oscillating in time so when this electrons arrive to the second cavity then they are accelerated too and in the following cavities the same so they are accelerated in all the cavities and the, the cavities are accelerated are designed to obtain this acceleration the problem of these uh, rf cavities are the surface breakdown that pablo has talked about in the previous in the previous talk uh, in this case we have that there is an emission of electrons from the surface because of uh, quantum tunneling and then we can uh, it can produce the the burn of the of the protrusion and finally it can produce uh, the reflection of some electromagnetic fields or a permanent damage in the in the cavities and they can uh, not be used anymore this is a, a phenomenon that only appears for uh, high electric fields and it limits the 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 maximum electric field that we can obtain to 100 megavolt per meter. So what can we do if we can, if we want to obtain high uh, energy particles? The idea is basically to uh, use a synchrotron, a circular accelerator where the particles are traveling in a ring using uh, bending magnets to obtain the circular motion and these particles are accelerated each time that they pass in the in the RF cavities. However, the synchrotrons have two main problems. One is the radiated energy. When a charged particle is accelerated, it radiates energy according to the Lienard formula. That is this. And basically this formula says that when the acceleration is linear, the radiation is negligible, as for example in the RF cavities, but 
uh, where, the where we have a circular motion as in the bending magnets, then this uh, energy, this radiated energy becomes very important. The energy loss per turn can be calculated with this expression that depends on the energy of the particle, the mass of the particle and the radius of curvature of the circular motion. So, it is very important for light particles because we have the mass here in the denominator and uh, specifically for electrons. Uh, moreover, as we have here the, the energy, it is very important for high energetic particles. For example, if we have electrons with 3 giga electron volts in an accelerator with a radius of 42 meters, that, uh, that are typical values for the synchrotron alba in Barcelona, then the loss is about 170 kilo electron volts per turn. But if the energy will be 30 giga electron volts, then the energy loss per turn will be 1.7 giga electron volts, and maybe we cannot restore this energy loss only with the RF uh, cavities. So this is a limitation to the maximum energy that we can obtain. The other problem is the magnetic rigidity. In the bending magnets, the circular is, is the motion is basically uh, circular. So as we have an homogeneous magnetic field, the Lorentz force says that as we don't have electric field and the, and the velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular, then the modulus of the force is this. We equate to the centrifugal force and we obtain finally this equation that says that this uh, product of the radius of curvature and the magnitude field is basically the, moment, the ratio between the momentum and the charge of the particle. Uh, in typical units used in accelerators, basically as the energy is the product of the momentum and the speed of light, then we obtain this expression and say that if we want a very high uh, energy, then we have to, ha to obtain a very high product of the radius of curvature and the magnitude field. Uh, however, there is a limitation uh, in the magnetic field because we cannot obtain uh, magnetic fields higher than to a few tesla. So if we want higher energies, we need to increase the radius of curvature. For example, for a proton with an energy of 3 tera electron volts, we need, if we use a magnetic field of 5 tesla, we need 2 kilometers of radius of curvature or uh, 12, uh, kil about 12 kilometers or length of the accelerator. Uh, well, the solution to obtain higher energies is uh, to make the, the length of the accelerator uh, larger. Uh, there is, this is very important, the magnetic rigidity is a limitation for heavy particles, because we, we can see here that this product is proportional to the mass. So it's very important for protons or ions. So what can we do if we want to obtain higher energies? We can, for example, make larger accelerators. For example, it has been proposed to build an uh, accelerator that uh, where the particles are uh, traveling around the Earth or traveling around the galaxy. But it is very expensive because we will need bending magnets along all this trajectory and it's almost impossible. So what can we do? <laughs> or no, I don't know in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do? Uh, so we can increase the accelerating gradient, the, that is the electric field, using an alternative technique to the conventional RF technology. Uh, moreover, if the particle wins the sufficient energy in a single pass, it will not be necessary to use a, a circular accelerator, so we don't have the problems of the radiated energy or the, the magnetic rigidity. Uh, some novel techniques are the plasma wave field accelerators, plasmonic accelerators, the electric accelerators, or solid state accelerators. And I'm going to focus on these two uh, techniques that are something similar to a surfer that is winning velocity when he's surfing in the, in the sea. So, in the laser or plasma wave field accelerators, we have to start with a, with a laser where the electric field that we can obtain is something of the order of 20 terabolt per meter, that is five orders of magnitude higher than uh, the electric fields that are obtained in, to accelerate in the RF cavities. However, these electric fields cannot be used to accelerate because 
if we have a laser, the electromagnetic fields that are produced are perpendicular to the direction of motion of the laser. And we want that the electric field uh, has the same, uh, the same direction that the, speed, that the direction of motion, because we want that the particles travel together with the laser to achieve a permanent uh, winning of energy of the particles from the, from the laser. Uh, it can be seen from the from the Lorentz force, where this term is always perpendicular to the to the velocity, and the, the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of motion. So the force that experiences the particles is perpendicular to the to the, velo to the velocity. Well, the the solution is using a, a plasma. The plasma is basically the fourth state of the matter that is, used, that is obtained when we increase the energy and is typically an electrically quasi-neutral medium of unbound positive and negative charged particles. So, what is happening when a laser travels in a plasma? So, then the electrons move because the, the, transverse, the high transverse electric field, but the, the positive charge, as they are heavier than the electrons, they almost don't move, and this, this bubble is created. So there is a zone here where these electrons are trapped because here, this, and moreover, these electrons are always accelerated because here we have positive particles, so they are attracting these electrons, and moreover, we have these electrons that are repelling these electrons. So the two contributions are a force on this electrons. Moreover, they, as the electrons are very light, they become ultra relativistic very soon and they start to travel at the speed of light as the laser, so they are traveling together with the laser. So the idea of this technique is basically to uh, insert a laser in a plasma, this laser creates the bubbles and then and we inject the electron beam that we want to accelerate at the proper distance to obtain that these electrons are the are trapped and are always accelerated. Uh, the, this technique is called laser wave field acceleration because it uses a laser and the basically uh, limitation is the, the wave breaking that uh, and the electric, maximum electric field that we can obtain uh, is proportional to the square root of the plasma electrons. For typical values of these densities, uh, this maximum electric field is about 100 gigavolt per meter, that is three orders of magnitude higher than for RF technology. There is other technique that is very similar, that where the only difference is that instead of using a laser to create the bubbles, it uses an electron beam or a proton beam to create the, the bubbles, but it's the same. The, the, the same. And this technique is called plasma wave field accelerator. Well, the second technique that I want to, to talk about is, pl is about plasmonic accelerators. Uh, well, as you know, a metal can be understood as uh, some atoms, some ions, and then the, the electrons of the conduction band that are free, that are moving free, and it can explain, for example, the conductivity of the metals. So plasmonics is only the, the study of the interaction between electromagnetic fields and these uh, free electrons that can be understood as something similar to a gas that is called the free electron Fermi gas. And then, when we have an electromagnetic wave that arrives to a, to a metal, it can uh, produce the, some collective oscillation of these conduction electrons in the metals and excite the, the so-called uh, plasma. That is sim something similar to, to a photon, but, well, a photon is a, the particle associated with the, with the light, with, the, with an electromagnetic wave, and the plasmon is uh, the quasi-particle associated with these oscillations in the metal. Uh, we can calculate that the, these oscillations are produced at a frequency that is the plasma frequency that depends on the square root of the, of the, plasma, of the, of the density of the, of the electrons of the conduction band. So the idea of these, accelerator, of these accelerators is to use a laser or a drive beam that is uh, traveling inside a cylinder this is, here we have a cut of the, of the cylinder in a plane, and then it can produce the, the oscillation of these electrons. We have zones with electrons and zones with absence of electrons, and for this reason we have this pattern of electric fields that are quite similar to the 
electric fields that are created in RF cavities. So we can use this, uh, this plasmonic, th this excitation of plasmons to accelerate in something similar, in some, in some way similar to the, the RF cavities. The difference is that here we have some uh, apertures of the about micrometers, here is, is about centimeters. The length of accelerator of the acceleration is about millimeters, and here is about tens of centimeters or meters. The maximum electric field that we can obtain is about 100 gigavolt per meter, that, that is three orders of magnitude higher than, he, than here. And moreover, the operation is some mm, different because uh, here the, the laser, the, the electron beam that we can accelerate, or the proton beam that we, well, that we want to accelerate, uh, is propagating uh, together with the laser or the drive beam that is uh, producing these, these plasmons. And here we uh, excite the, the electromagnetic uh, fields, but these electromagnetic fields are not propagating together with the, with the electrons or protons that are accelerated. So, to finish, here we, I have a, a summary. Uh, the main limitations in cyclotrons are basically the losses due to the radiation that uh, are very important for electrons and the magnetic rigidity that is important for heavy particles. We can increase the length of the accelerators to obtain uh, high energies or use new techniques of acceleration. Here I have a, a table with a, with a summary. Here we have the conventional RF cavities, the principle that are based. The, the maximum electric field that we can obtain and the limitation. These are the two techniques that I have explained before. And then we have other technique that is the electrolytic the, the electrolytic driver acceleration. Here we have a scheme that uses quartz or silicon structures and we can obtain electric fields of about two orders of magnitude higher than for conventional RF cavities. And the solid state plasma wave field acceleration that uses the, the solid state properties of, crust, of crystals, carbon nanotubes or, nano, or nanochannels. It predicts uh, electro, electric fields to accelerate about 1 to 10 terabolt per meter, so 4 or 6 orders of magnitude higher than RF cavities. And this is the, is very, well, I am investigating on carbon nanotubes and it's something similar to these two techniques because we have a beam that we want to accelerate that is traveling in the, inside the cylinder. It can uh, excite the plasmons in the surface of the cylinder, but moreover, it can uh, obtain some electrons from the ions, from the carbon ions, and create the bubbles, these bubbles that are used uh, to accelerate in plasma wave field acceleration. Well, the main problems of these new techniques in comparison with the RF cavities is that it's very difficult to obtain uh, electron beams or proton beams with the sufficient quality in terms of, of about, for example, 10 to the 10 uh, electrons with approximately the same energy and the same direction. This is the main problem of these new techniques in comparison with RF cavities where it's easier to obtain this, this quality. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Very interesting. So, we have questions, comments, criticisms? No? Well, I can start. Um, in the case of, of, the, uh, of the laser uh, wake field acceleration, mm -hmm. you said that the, um, the, uh, you have a limitation based on the density of the material that you're crossing, right? Yeah. And this is because of the opacity, so the absorption of the of the laser, or is there anything else? So it's it's just a matter of uh, radiative transfer, or uh, I or think that is or what's mm, the physical process? It's more it? related to the that then if we uh, if you mm, for, mm, I think that it's uh, related to the creation of the bubbles. That if you uh, you can not um, create the bubbles, something like this. That the the, the, the wave that is creating that cannot the expand further because of yeah. the density of the And then second question, uh, which is related to this one, and but it's general for all the cases. You always test this in labs, right? Yes, but there this are there are some techniques that are not 
still implemented or yes. yeah. well the galaxy uh, the galactic thing yeah <laughs> no. I, I can tell you that you will never see that uh, okay but <laughs> so so the second question is and I'm throwing stones of, on my own roof because I do supercomputing but uh, wouldn't it be cheaper or easier to test this uh, in using numerical codes Yes, we use numerical codes to... Ah, okay, okay. So the, the problem is to implement it experimentally. There are some techniques that are... So that prior, prior to, to, ex to the experiments, you do... You do yes. Okay, yes, I, yes, see, yes. I see. Yeah. And which codes do you use? Peak codes that are part oh, particle, particle itself. In cell okay, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Ah, very interesting. Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, for those of you who don't know, particle in cell codes are uh, uh, codes that, that uh, work with basic uh, laws of physics for applied to particles and magnetic fields. And, uh, and well, sometimes when in my field they use shock waves to, to, to see how particles accelerate. Okay, any more questions or comments? Yep. Well, thank you, Pablo. Um, I have a question. Let us imagine that I want to construct an accelerator equivalent to the LHC, for example, and I use one of these techniques. What should be the length of the accelerator? Well, if you use some of these new techniques, maybe you don't need the ring of the accelerator because you, if you obtain the, the energy that you want only with a single pass on, the, on these accelerators, you, uh, you don't construct the ring because it has some problems as the, the magnetic rigidity or the radiated energy. So only you, you only need this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this linear accelerator. And, uh, the idea is to construct an accelerator with some meters. So you can, you, you can construct, construct it and you can uh, have this, uh, this accelerator in a room. Well, hmm. that's just the ratio is 100 gigavolts per meter, right? So you yes. This uh, laser wake field acceleration method, uh, which is the base of, uh, I mean, is it fiber optics or which are the mediums where you uh, like do the, the pulsed uh, laser? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, um, well, uh, I think that mm, no, you, you don't use fiber optics. I think that you don't use fiber optics. Basically, I think that you uh, increase the temperature of, of of some medium and you create this this plasma. But I think that the fiber optics are not used. So these are Alven waves. So, to, so these plasmons are related to the propagation of Alven waves, or, or Oof, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Explore, explore on that. <laughs> <laughs> Homework. Thanks. Um, the, in this method, uh, the plasma one, um, I thought that plasma is usually at very high temperatures. Is not that a problem for like refrigeration of the accelerator? No, I think that no. <laughs> I think that no. <laughs> but it, it's, it's the problem is that experimentally, some of these techniques are, have not been implemented. So maybe when when we implement them, we have the problem of <laughs> some problems of this. But in principle, no. Thanks. So I think it's time to to move on. Thank you, Pablo, for your okay. nice talk.
Sí, ah, el micro. Ah, vale, 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 vuelve, vuelve. Ay, pues está en marcha, ¿eh? Pasó con se apaga. Uh, well, this is the, the last talk of the school. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. Um, and I would like to, just because later we will, uh, we will finish and maybe it's not the moment, to thank the organizing committee for, for the work they did, uh, especially Carlos Alvarez, who is in the control of, of the YouTube streaming. Uh, an applause for Carlos Alvarez, please. <laughs> And uh, also to, to the rest of the people, some of them are here, like uh, Carmen Aloto and uh, Carlos Miró and Daniel and, uh, hello, uh, well, you're there, uh, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm forgetting anyway, but somebody, but anyway, the others are sleeping, I guess, so uh, <laughs> now it's my, my deep pleasure to, to introduce a friend uh, and a colleague, uh, Pedro Ruiz Castell, who studied physics, uh, this is another path for you guys, uh, another possible path. The, he studied physics with us and then he moved to the University of Oxford to pursue a PhD on the history of science. Then he, uh, he was uh, working in the Museum of Science and Technology in Madrid, also doing research also at the Autonomous University in Barcelona until he came back here. He's a, a permanent professor in our university, but he's uh, now not working with us because he is a member of the Valencian Parliament, uh, devoted to, to well, uh, university issues and so on, and he's doing very well there. So he will be telling us in a chill out session uh, about uh, what uh, kind of science, in particular astronomy, could be done and was done during the times of the National Catholic uh, Dictatorship of uh, Francisco Franco. So enjoy and uh, yeah, keep your questions to the end, I guess. <laughs> thank you, Pedro. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Manel. It's uh, actually a great pleasure to be here uh, back as an alumni, uh, an alumnus actually of the university, of, the, of this faculty, which I'm, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes I always, when I come back here, I always claim the need to have history of physics back in the curriculum, but I'm afraid that's something you ha have to be done by, by, by the teachers here. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, I must apologize in advance uh, because as uh, Manel said, I, uh, I've been three years out of uh, academia and uh, haven't spoken much English and haven't spoken much about my research, so probably a little bit rusty and uh, the, there, may, the, there might be some vocabulary problems as well because it's not an easy task to talk about um, Franco's dictatorship in English. Uh, mm, it's not in Spanish, right? <laughs> well in Spanish it's not that not that difficult I guess um, but certainly there are some some um, of uh, mm, words uh, that uh, have been taken from my research uh, which are not are not easy to translate uh, anyway uh, probably the best thing to end uh, this summer school after yesterday's party is talking about parties, uh, and that's what we're going to do somehow today. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, because that's the other thing, when I ask about the audience, uh, I think there's a uh, quite heterogeneous audience with foreigners, uh, secondary school students, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, Franco's dictatorship. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, as you probably know, it was uh, on the 18th of July, 1936, that uh, Spaniards uh, awoke to the news that a military coup d'etat uh, had been staged against the elected uh, leftist government of the, of the Second Spanish Republic, and it was actually the start of the Spanish Civil War, uh, a, cl a conflict that actually was devastating and marked the beginning of one of the uh, longest European dictatorships uh, in Europe in the 20th century. Uh, now, well, there are some, some, uh, uh, some
some images of, of what appear in the news during those years. Uh, but I'm going to focus on, on the uh, dictatorial period, basically, in which, in which a very specific narrative was built to justify uh, the regime and uh, somehow glorify it. Uh, and uh, in a period in which uh, the history of Spain was actually um, mm, distorted intentionally and presented as a somehow a, a combination of chaos, uh, adversities, problems, uh, and that it was uh, General Francisco Franco who came and solved the situation. And such a, such a discourse, such a narrative, uh, which criminalized the Second Spanish Republic, uh, which defended that military coup d'etat, uh, was present in all uh, the different um, areas, including science as well, uh, which for some people who are not familiar with uh, historical uh, studies might be a little bit surprising, but science is also another cultural expression. And uh, of course, it also suffer of such imposition. Um, one of the first things was actually to, to, to build uh, new institutions, new scientific institutions such as the Spanish National Research Council, el CSIC, el Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, uh, specifically erected to, to uh, introduce those ideas and those interests of the, of the new regime. Uh, and of course, trying to uh, forget about what, was, what, what had been happening before uh, particularly those institutions that had been uh, raised during the liberal tradition of the Republican period. Now, uh, the idea behind those movements was to create a national and Catholic science at the service of the regime interests. And uh, one must bear in mind that, of course, the dictatorship uh, meant a, a break, uh, you know, it was a different uh, period from what happened before, and uh, we have facts that show that. There was the purge, the exile, you know, scientists have to move uh, abroad. There was also this internal exile by means of which some uh, lecturers or scientific researchers uh, were taken aside of their positions. Uh, but at the same time, there are also some continuities, and uh, that's one of the things that historians of science usually do. When we look at the big picture, uh, we tend to mark clearly the differences between periods, uh, but sometimes it's not such an easy explanation uh, what was going on. And there were some underlying continuities uh, which appear when you uh, study in depth what was going on. And uh, the idea of this talk was somehow to, to explore the evolution of, of some of the uh, scientific practices of the amateur astronomy during, those, during that, that, that period. And why do I focus on amateur astronomy? Well, first of all, because as I will talk about, I will, I will say astronomy was fairly popular subject in Spain, uh, well, actually all over the world. But at the same time, I focus on uh, amateur uh, practice of science because amateurs were not that easy to control, to supervise. Right? The sort of activities they were doing were not under the supervision of the official national and Catholic science that was doing that task, was being done by the Scientific Research Council. And they did it, obviously, through funding. They did it also uh, having the, the, the influence over the, the, the um, editorial boards, for instance, of scientific uh, uh, journals. Uh, even the boards that decided what lecturers had to take the positions, they were also highly influenced by by this uh, research council, which was, as I said, set up to, to, to present a very specific vision of science and research. And uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit about that later. But uh, as I said, I focus on astronomy and amateur astronomy because uh, it was a fairly popular uh, discipline, uh, particularly during the second half of the 19th century, and uh, we were talking about that before, uh, uh, the, the amateurs played a crucial role in the development of astrophysics. Uh, there was these grand amateurs which were uh, free, had money, some of them, and they attached uh, spectrographs, uh, um, 
photographic cameras to the telescopes and began to discover about the nature, uh, and mostly the chemical nature of stars, etc. Uh, but all those discoveries meant that the public imagination was, uh, um, was, was kept by, by um, uh, you know, the, 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 the scientists of, of the period. And uh, this also happened in Spain under the influence of French astronomy. We had one of the biggest and most important uh, popularizers of astronomy of the late 19th century and early 20th century, which was Camille Flammarion, uh, who set up a society, the French Astronomical Society, to boost that cooperation between uh, amateurs and professionals, because he thought that the role that amateurs had to play in astronomy was crucial. Uh, and of course, uh, he encouraged original contributions he also developed a very important popularization of astronomy program, and that made of astronomy uh, a fairly, uh, as I say, popular subject all over the world, but also, uh, and particularly in Spain under the French influence. And uh, as a result, for instance, in the 1910s, uh, there was created one society, which is the Astronomical Society of Barcelona, to boost that uh, cooperation or encourage the uh, the, the, the activity of amateurs devoted to astronomy and meteorology. And one year later, because of the ego fights probably, uh, it was also in Barcelona set up another uh, astronomical society of Spain, later of Spain and America, which is uh, still currently uh, alive. And uh, uh, it was um, founded by Josep Comas y Solà, who was a, a Catalan astronomer, uh, who, who under the wing of Flammarion, developed also a very powerful uh, astronomical or popularization of astronomy program uh, that actually meant uh, that, that, that astronomy, not only in Barcelona, but all over Spain, uh, acquired a real high status. Um, it's fun that the figure of Comas y Solà, who died in 1937, was not recovered by Franco's dictatorship and uh, been, as you can see, uh, a, a highly renowned popularizer. Uh, and it was not because he, he was a member of the, of the um, Confederación Nacional del Trabajo, which is a sort of an anarcho-syndicalist uh, union, mm, uh, of course, very much attached to the left uh, uh, positions uh, that were also present in the Spanish Republic. And uh, some of the people that had grown uh, their, their uh, interest on astronomy uh, under Comas y Solas program, actually complained in 1947 when uh, uh, the commemoration of the, of, the, of the death of the astronomer was not celebrated. Um, never mind. Uh, the point here is how those societies uh, develop quite a lot of activities uh, that brought together thousands of people uh, in, in lectures, in uh, uh, courses, in, in visits to the Faber Observatory, like that one, which was an observatory uh, set up in Barcelona, and uh, ended up conferring such legitimacy uh, and authority, both to Comas y Solá, both to the society he had founded, and of course to astronomy. And let me do a break here, because uh, the success of, of amateur astronomy uh, has also to do with a very specific issue on the 20th century. And that has to do with the amateur telescope making movement, uh, uh, which transform the discipline in a real popular one. We were talking before about amateurs. Most of them had the money to pursue the, the telescopes, and they could, you know, as a laser, mm, observe the heavens. But the amateur telescope making movement, what meant was that people could build their own telescopes. And this, for instance, was a huge thing in, in the States. Uh, in the United States, in the decade of the 20s, some people began to develop and popularize uh, how to build, how to produce telescopes homemade, uh, of course, of good quality, in, in, in a contest that also included other other technologies such as telegraphy or radio, uh, you know, these amateurs that set up their radios at home and, uh, you know, this homemade uh, technophilia that
that uh, was present in the States. It also arrived to Spain somehow, uh, but the truth is that uh, the Civil War meant a uh, stop to that, to that um, spreading of uh, that sort of knowledge. Uh, but it will come back afterwards. Uh, now, the point here is we need to understand how the post-war in Spain was a period of uh, intense social propaganda. Uh, scientific practice, and uh, this was actually said by the members of the CSIC, the founders of the CSIC, uh, had to be under the, um, the influence of, of the Catholic doctrine. Uh, and this was particularly the case for astronomy, which, which was a discipline that could make people understand that God existed outside and that it was a creation and had been also very much linked to all these religious, religious uh, beliefs, right? Uh, so astronomy kept that a status that had acquired in the early 20th century and uh, as I kept it during, during post-war. Uh, now, the problem was that in the new regime, all the societies like uh, Sadella, this astronomical society of, of Spain and, and America, had to be approved again by the government. Uh, there was, as I said, a very strong interest in control any activity that had to do with whatever expression. And that also uh, implied science, that also implied astronomy, no matter how old those societies were, they had to ask to be approved again to uh, start again their activity. And for instance, Sadella uh, asked in 1940 uh, the, about, I mean, that they asked for, for such an authorization, which arrived finally in 1944. And they did it in many ways. They even, even uh, declared Franco as uh, their, their um, president of honor uh, as a way to uh, honor their, their protection of the patriotic science, uh, and that's actually what it said in this, in this uh, journal. Uh, what happened here is very interesting also because the society was run by professional astronomers, but also senior, astronom sen senior amateur astronomers. And um, despite the fact that they tried to encourage the interest of amateurs, and they did it so by, for instance, uh, encouraging the observation of, of uh, variable stars and other programs, uh, they also had to deal with the enthusiasm, as they put it, of uh, young people. Uh, and there is, I think, I think there is also a quotation there uh, about the, the such interest and the president of the society in a discourse in 1944 said, uh, I, have, have, I don't have my glasses here, so I can read it, but bursting with initiatives eager to conduct research, we have had much to our regret to stop their enthusiasm several times. So young people were like, uh, we want to do things, but we're not very happy about the way things are being, doing, are being done in, 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 this, in this society. And um, now the passion for, for astronomy uh, of such young people uh, has to be also understand as a way to find new spaces for sociability under a dictatorial regime. And uh, if we take those different ideas, we, made, we might explain, some, at least in part, why new astronomical associations, amateur astronomical associations, appeared during post-war uh, Spain as a response, as an answer to a new political situation, a new socio-economical situation of the, uh, the dictatorship, and a new understanding of where the spaces for socialization and sociability should, should be. And uh, as a result, we have that in 1948, a group of secondary school students found the new astronomical association called ASTER um, in such a search for a scientific sociability or for a space for scientific sociability uh, uh, in a space that, of course, the aim was to 
get all cultural and educative resources, uh, but also to socialize in a different way and not under the supervision of uh, the, the, the main uh, mm, national Catholic uh, science that was being developed. Um, it is true that such foundation was not extend, um, ex exempt from, from criticism and controversy, and uh, the new association was also based in Barcelona, where already were a couple of initiatives have been developed before, and uh, some people complain about the fact that it seemed that they repeat what others had said in the late 19th century, that they were actually uh, under legal age, and uh, this is part of, of that uh, interesting criticism. And you can read here, uh, it was published in, in, in the journal, uh, would do better to worry about drinking their bottles, biberones, right, uh, on time, rather than wasting their time writing about what they know nothing. Uh, they were secondary school students. Uh, well, I'll be honest, it seemed quite good to me, of course. There are no differential equations in its pages, but we must recognize that there is no pomp and circumstance either. It's a model of simplicity and noble aims. And the other guy said, stop this nonsense. Uh, whoever wants to popularize astronomy today must talk about current affairs and not repeat what Flammarion said back in the 1960s. Uh, so have you told them about the problems that concern astronomers today? I am convinced that it, if this group of enthusiastic amateurs continues with such enterprise, we will soon see breaking news articles in the pages of Haster. But as far as I know, no building has ever been erected without slowly raising it. Anyway, we shall see. Uh, of course, uh, there were there were there was a perception that uh, that the um, popularization of astronomy program uh, that Astor developed, uh, which included, as Flammarion said, as Comas y Sola did as well, lectures, courses, visits to observatories, also excursions, uh, uh, also um, there are different visits to natural sites, and in less than three years they managed to move. 3,000 people who assisted to their organized uh, observations, astronomical observations. And uh, they also completed this with, for instance, the projection of movies and documentaries, uh, musical seasons uh, on musical concerts on, on, on the premises of the, of the association. And uh, actually some of those materials but were, were, were provided by uh, foreign institutions like the embassies of uh, the United States and uh, France. And we must keep in mind that at that point in the 1950s, uh, it was this, uh, the making of that, the agreement, the agreement that uh, again legitimized Franco's regime with the United States. And uh, there, was, there were big efforts from those countries in order to create what they say citizens uh, that could avoid the traditional and uh, uh, yeah, old mm, mm, uh, ideas present in, the, uh, in Spain, and they were willing to make or were willing to transform those citizens into, into modern citizens with values and knowledge able to change the situation of a developing country like, like Spain. Uh, of course, you know, there are also some... some people who mm, were not convinced about the success that, uh, success that, that, that could have the such enterprise. And uh, we have here uh, one of the members of Aster uh, you know, saying how people had suggested, with some irony, if the association would survive after a year or, of, or if it be would become a club, uh, which would be astronomical just in its name. Uh, and, and that also had to do with the fact that uh, there were organized uh, after some of the courses and lectures what they would call guateques. Uh, it's a difficult word to translate as well, uh, but there's so, sort of mm, old uh, style parties, uh, let's put it that way, uh, in which people could dance, drink, soft drinks mostly, uh, have some, some food. And um, this is not just an anecdote. Uh, we must remember that uh, parties, and in particular dancing, had been a way to articulate uh, laser in Spain, particularly for young people 
uh, four years, and in fact, during the first half of the, or the first uh, decades of the 20th century, uh, most cultural associations had uh, organized dancing as a way to promote their activities. But after the Civil War, during the dictatorship, uh, the regime was quite concerned about how to, not to stop that, but to control that, uh, control such parties, uh, and uh, particularly through educative campaigns in which, of course, the Catholic Church play a crucial role. And, uh, of course, parties and dancing were organized during these years, but, but minors, those who had not the legal age, with, which, by the, by the way, was 21 under the dictatorship, uh, could not attend to such, to such parties. And uh, so in that sense, the creation of these amateur astronomical associations uh, was a way to claim for a different culture, uh, for a different way to socialize between young people, autonomous as well, and uh, that would make, in the end, after a few years, the growing of alternative uh, spaces that were not controlled or supervised by, by adults or the regime. Uh, and, and this was seen, I mean, this, this, it, it was seen as a quite dangerous activity for some people, and uh, some members of the, of the Astronomical Society of Spain and America actually filed formal complaints uh, to the authorities saying that the association uh, had been or were, was run by uh, minors and uh, they actually they organized promiscuous uh, activities uh, because you know dancing together that was uh, something that had to be supervised by the by the authorities and uh, the president of, of the society uh, uh, had to go with his father because he was a minor to the civil governor to ask for a special permission to explain, of course, the aims of the society after the file was complained, uh, that the complaint was filed, sorry, uh, formally. They had to, he was called to the civil governor uh, in Barcelona. He had to explain the aims of the society, had to explain the activities, and he got an exceptional authorization to pursue such, such, uh, uh, such sort of, of uh, activities. And uh, basically, I mean, some of the people who are a little bit more uh, open-minded uh, said that it was a really nice way, s way to hook uh, young people because they provided them at the beginning with um, superfluous activities, uh, superficial activities. They hooked the young people and then they could uh, probably move them to a more transcendental issues uh, such as the study of, of astronomy. And uh, here we have this the, the, the opening of uh, at the terrace and you know the, the uh, of the premises of, of the Astor building, uh, the, the opening of the new premises in 1943, I, I believe. Um, now there were we've been talking about lectures, courses, dancing, drinking. Uh, there were also uh, competitions, exhibitions, and in those exhibitions, for instance, uh, people presented their instruments. And uh, Astor, for instance, uh, in 1950, organized uh, uh, an astronomical exhibition in which, and it's interesting to see that, how institutional and official uh, institutions also took part of it, but also some other amateur astronomers like this one, which is a group Pro Divulgación Astronómica del Baix Montseny, uh, which was founded two months before the start of the Civil War in 1936 uh, at San Celoni, which is a village 40 kilometers away from Barcelona. Uh, and uh, it was a fairly small uh, society. It never had more than 20 members, but uh, it was very, very active. And uh, one of the members was, uh, what well you can see here, some of the, of the notes they took. Uh, there's a picture as well with some of the members uh, making some, some solar observations. And uh, the group actually at the very beginning, it seemed more like a like, uh, 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 space to produce instruments rather than an association to popularize astronomy. And even when they acquired 
uh, commercial telescope in 1937, they kept working with uh, optical materials that were recycled uh, in order to produce their own uh, instruments. And uh, this is very much uh, uh, linked to the idea that I presented before, which is the amateur telescope making movement. And uh, it's not that they were doing the same, but there was that interest in there, uh, because amateur telescope making had a very important difficulty, which was uh, the way that, uh, the particularly when you wanted to, to, to produce uh, reflectors, uh, you had to polish the mirror. You have to grind, to grind the mirror. And that's not as easy as it may, it may look uh, or it may seem. And uh, so in the 50s, few people recovered some of the articles that had been published in the 20s in the States, another ones that had been published also in the 50s in France. And it is funny to see how, despite the fact that the Spanish authorities wanted to avoid any foreign influence in the Spanish development of science, in the development of Spanish Catholic science, amateur groups were one of the different methods that scientists had, even if they were amateurs, to establish those links with foreign scientists and this with for other foreign amateur astronomers uh, because those mm, papers published abroad were tr translated in here and uh, some, some uh, relationships were, were established. And we have, for instance, in the case of, of uh, this group, how people like Josep Costas, which is this man in here, uh, began to produce their own mirrors and uh, actually in the 60s he began to even attend uh, to the demands of other amateur astronomers. He produced in his life more than 3,500 parabolic mirrors for reflector telescopes. He explained the techniques at the uh, back office of his, of his business. Uh, he was a, was a how you call this, a custom uh, ultramarinos, which actually I don't know how to translate that into Spanish, e into English either. So it's not, a, well, you know, you could buy probably a anything there, uh, <laughs> like a small supermarket. <laughs> uh, I think it has a name in English, like customer, or no, I can't remember. Um, never mind. Uh, but, you know, he had his own business, and then he produced all those, all those mirrors, and uh, they were, they, 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 were, they were provided to many different um, amateur astronomers that thanks to such instruments could keep that tradition that came from the late 19th century. So in order to, to conclude, I think, because I, I don't want to uh, spend much time, and uh, uh, what, what I want to say is like, first of all, when we talk about science, and this has to do with astronomy or any other science or scientific practice, uh, we're talking about a cultural expression, we're talking about something that is negotiated, something that could be influenced uh, by the authorities. And uh, so forget about that idea of scientists do research uh, in their ivory tower away from any uh, political influence because it's not true. Uh, and you can actually see that specifically in those cases which are when, when, when it's really clear, when there is a declaration from the very beginning, for instance, of the creation of a new institution just to produce a Spanish national science under the ideas of Catholic, uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church uh, under a very specific ideology. And uh, so that's, that's one of the ideas I want you to keep in, in mind. Uh, the other one is how the, the, the techniques uh, that followed Josep Costas, these mm, uh, procedures coming from the amateur telescope making movement contributed to, to really, um, mm, I would say that, mm, it actually con contributed to, to maintain that amateur astronomy movement that had been present in Spain during all the dictatorship I mean, it was a way to introduce 
the uh, idea of amateur astronomy as a real popular and mass uh, 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 subject. And, and uh, of course, how the members of such new associations, what they were doing somehow is to, to react to, uh, and there are several um, studies on socialization, sociability, that point out how important are associations in order to react, to give a response, to answer to political and socioeconomical uh, context. And in this case, to a very particular one, the answer was we're going to establish these new societies and uh, as, an, as an alternative society for socialization in which science played a crucial role. And uh, so it was a generational response uh, to the, that need to adapt themselves to a new uh, context. And there were also spaces for somehow freedom and uh, to transfer knowledge or ways of thinking that were not always uh, the ones they could see in their, in their environment. And um, of course that somehow uh, counterbalanced the, the other spaces of sociability that had been imposed during the Franco's regime and that actually contributed to the gradual uh, reconstruction of, of civil society. And uh, on the other side, and to finish, uh, let me tell you that those initiatives, which may seem very you know, distinctive and uh, counter, uh, well, as a, as a reaction, they were not seen as something dangerous for, for the regime. Uh, there was not something challenging, mostly because like data, you know, uh, anything could be taken and transformed and uh, uh, in a sort of, of produce your own narrative with it. And uh, Franco's regime uh, used those uh, successful, uh, because for, for instance, Aster was one of the, the first, I think was the first amateur astronomical association that detected the signal of Sputnik 1 in Western Europe with a homemade radio and an antenna. And uh, so that sort of discourse was also very interesting for the regime when used properly because they were trying to reproduce histories of uh, heroes that despite the difficulties, despite the post-war, were able to uh, produce novel knowledge, of course, Spanish knowledge, uh, and the very specific ideological uh, lines. Uh, but you also have this idea of, of social harmony, of cooperation, of union, of glorification of the youth, uh, of the youth, which was also present in other aspects. And they were, you know, publicized all their, their, their programs and successful uh, initiatives in, in the press, in the radio, and even in the Spanish new, newsreel, uh, the Nodo, uh, which actually you can go to the uh, website and uh, check some of them and see how the regime was trying to sell the discourse of a Spanish national uh, uh, science also through these associations. And uh, so it was also used for the other side of the, of the medal. And uh, finally, you know, the point is how, how even during the dictatorship and even despite the efforts of trying to prevent that the Spanish national Catholic science was not or had no influence from abroad, uh, the amateur astronomers managed to keep such links and establish this cooperation which also, which also was, was crucial, uh, not only for amateur astronomers but also for, for professionals. And uh, I think that's it, I'll leave it here. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions, comments? I, I have like 20, but, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, should I start then? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, first of all, um, within this national Catholic perspective of, of life and of the universe and everything, um, 
these people, uh, I guess they were aware of the, of the news of, the, of Hubble's results in the 20s and so on, and the expansion of the universe and, and blah, blah, uh, which was uh, expected to be static and peaceful before. Um, how did they deal with this? I mean, do you they have didn't. any news, any new, d sorry, they didn't, they just forgot that, that, that okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah and we still do that, when we don't like the data, we just remove it, yeah. Well, I mean, of course, <laughs> like, like any, any result has to, has to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, it's not, it's mm. not true, but there was not such a big, um, I mean, the, the idea was, yeah, let's forget about we, w what it does not interest us, and let's focus on those issues that may be uh, more more effective for our our uh, agenda. And uh, the thing is that you have to understand that uh, in the 40s, one of I mean the merit to to become a professor was uh, being a member of the of the national movement, and uh, that's how professorships were given. Uh, so you couldn't. Uh, you know, you, 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 you couldn't, couldn't use you this for couldn't raise uh, problematic issues that much, or if you did so, you had to rearrange them in order that could be reinterpreted. But this is l the same as happened during the 17th century with the Inquisition, and and uh, yeah, yeah, right. So it's <laughs> very similar. Thing, yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. And um, you mentioned an antenna, radio antenna. I was you said this after. Uh, Another question came to my mind, which is about well, the, the evolution of astronomy during the 20th century. Mm -hmm. That moved from optical astronomy, only optical astronomy, to all the uh, mm -hmm. spectrum with mm -hmm. time. But, but at these at this years, radio astronomy was al already there. So they did also some radio astronomy. Not really. No. Okay. Not really. Not really. They just uh, tried to detect signals in the case of Sputnik, mm -hmm. and they 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 began a very, I mean. Radio astronomy was more uh, an amateur thing than an institutional thing, uh, and they attempted to, and uh, of course it, it ended up developing such, uh, but uh, it was not easy for them either. Um, and was there any uh, remarkable professional astronomy in, in universities or insti uh, research institutes? There were institutes? few, uh, but they were mostly devoted to uh, well, at the Observatory of Madrid, there were few, but they were not dealing with these sort of issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that that ha that had been a constant uh, in in Spanish uh, astronomy. We were we, we I mean, Spaniards arrived like 20, 30 years later, always. I mean, it happened with the study of total solar eclipses, and in terms of of during the 1900s, uh, if if we talk about it's not that it's not that the Spaniards were late; it's just that it took quite a lot to have the knowledge and the resources to, uh, to catch on to with international. Yeah, you know. but that happened, as I said. I mean, in the 80s, you had people in institutional observatories. In in the 19 in 1880s, you had people in institutional observatories doing um, astrophysics properly, uh, you know, spectroscopy and uh, and that began in Spain in the 1900s. Uh, so that delay, it was, it was not an immediate thing because you have to provide the resources and that was a problem. Anna. Uh, hi. <laughs> well, Hello. first, uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, my question is, uh, what about women? Because uh, I uh, it surprised me that uh, there was a lot of women in your pictures. And well, what about, about them in the um, uh, not amateur societies? Were they allowed? Mm -hmm. And wha uh, is it normal that they were uh, as much as in the photograph? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think I have to thank you for the title, I think, because Martina asked you about uh, how to translate actually Guateque, and from that conversation, <laughs> it came the, the name of, of the title. Uh, but uh, you, you're right, I mean, the, the women had a problem in the 19th century, and amateur societies were created in the 19th century, such as the British Astronomical Association, because the Royal Astronomical Association, I'm talking about the UK, right? Um, the Royal, and but that this could be 
extend it to other, to other countries. The Royal Astronomical Association, some people felt that the papers and the lectures were too technical and women were not allowed to be members of. And as a reaction to that, and new, new, sort, new societies were created, like, such as the British Astronomical Association. So that means that in the amateur world, women were seen uh, completely normal. And uh, they had their place, plus the fact that popularization of astronomy was like, you know, it was just under the liberal uh, democratic uh, ideals, you know, you, you should provide knowledge to anyone uh, in order to, to have better citizens. And uh, that also included women. Uh, this doesn't mean that they were expecting them to become professionals. That's a different thing, right? Uh, but, you know, amateur astronomy had a long um, tradition of women uh, pursuing astronomical observations. That actually comes, I mean, from back from the, from the 17th century. Uh, so the problem was that they were not officially recognized as societies as, an, as a result in the 19th century they began to organize themselves together with some men of course uh, in associations and and uh, so so yeah I mean women attended to these lectures and to this popularization of astronomy programs but they also were active probably not as much as men that's true but they were in there you could find them and following up her question, here in Spain, within the context of, of Franco's dictatorship, were women allowed to participate in this kind of scientific activities? They were. Uh, but what, what kind of activities are we talking about? Uh, the, these astronomical amateur uh, societies and such. Yeah, sure, that was not a problem. That was not a problem. Uh, I thought you were talking about the dancing and all those things, and that's why. <laughs> no, actually, but that's that's why people file complaints because you know there was, and that's why they define them as promiscuous because you could find young men and women dancing together in, and that that was a problem for the for the <laughs> Catholic. Huh? Under the stars. Under the stars. Yeah, that's right. Even more more dangerous. Yeah. Huh? yeah. More questions, comments. No. Okay. So well, I have more questions, but I can. Don't worry. We can. We can do it in the coffee break. Exactly. Okay. So well, thanks again the the committee, Martina, who you mentioned and is not here too, and and all all of you f to just for coming and and uh, hope you have enjoyed this week. Thank you, Pedro, for an excellent talk. My pleasure. So well, wish you well. Have a nice summer and uh, see you in September. Some of you and the others. Uh, well, hope to see you next year. <laughs> Bye.